Welcome to Artist Spotlight, everybody. Today we have Ron Wasserman. Ron is a television and game uh, composer. And he's going to tell us about his uh, field and how uh, some advice for all you who want to get into the film, television, and gaming uh, area as a com music composer. How are you doing, Ron? Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, man. So uh, where are you from and how did you get involved in um, pursuing a career in television and scoring and all that good stuff? Well, actually, I never planned on going into television at all. I had uh, started playing piano when I was three and started writing when I was five. And then in my teens and 20s, I was in all sorts of bands mm -hmm. and trying to get a deal there and had a little bit of success and ended up uh, working with a couple bands that were signed. It was fun. And then in 89, my uh, a friend that I'd worked on in those bands was working at Saban Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I went over there. He just asked me to come engineer for an afternoon or an evening and I just remember we sat around for a few hours, the composer and I had talked, and then he, uh, the guy blew out three cues in one hour and was making a, 150 bucks per cue. So I figured oh, wow. I, and I'm living on credit cards at this point. I'm like starving. <laughs> so I figured this is a, this is a business I should learn about. Mm -hmm. So um, while continuing the band stuff, I started engineering for other composers and, and spent took about three years for them to break me of the songwriting format and start to learn how to start scoring. And then um, slowly but surely, I started getting work. Mm -hmm. And the first you know, huge show I had was Power Rangers. And that just, so I was doing everything Saban could throw at me. And it was, um, it went straight for 25 years of seven days a week, not with Saban, but wow. just the phone was always ringing. And and still does just I'm um, just can't do seven days a week anymore. I'll I'll die. I'll <laughs> stroke. <laughs> oh my God, that's a that's a schedule. And just kind of piggyback on that. Uh, with the seven days a week, is it just because of the man the demand of uh, what the job you know requires? Is it just because you yes. just got so much work, or is it a little bit of both? Sometimes I'd be have two or three shows going at a time, and yeah. some of them also needed songs. So it was an intense amount of work. And then uh, later on, as things went, then you just start getting notes. So you're bouncing things up and back. A lot of it's technical work. So you send stuff, you get stuff, uh, notes back, you have to make changes. And then uh, especially doing television uh, sitcoms or, or stuff for Nickelodeon, mm -hmm. you know, you deliver everything on a Friday for a Monday mix. And on Sunday at 1130 p.m., you get notes about what they want fixed for the mix. So you've just got to sit there with sleeping with one eye and watch your phone waiting for those yeah. notes and then run into the studio and make the changes. So it's just it's an enormous amount of work. Wow. Wow. And who are you communicating with, uh, Ron, on a regular most often the director, showrunner, producer, showrunner most of the time? And then uh, sometimes it's the network that steps in and they want to give notes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, the notes will all come through the head of post-production. So whoever that person is mm -hmm. will relay the notes from the producers. But usually I developed a relationship with all the producers of the show or the network people, and they just would contact me directly. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now, do you have a, when you go in, do you like to kind of get a, uh, a firm grasp of what the show is trying to convey or scene or whatever, or is it like you're just trying to, or they're kind of giving you that like with the notes, or do you want to see the script? Do you want to see some of the animation, et cetera? Like how do you go about getting that, you know, that, that initial inspiration to, to carry on and get the job it's done? It's just a matter of, of coming up with ideas. Uh, when I, I did a show, I think it started in 2015 called The Thundermans on Nickelodeon. And at the initial meeting, they were meeting with a lot of composers. I walked in with five, uh, theme ideas, very short theme ideas, just mm -hmm. uh, saying this is what I think the show should be. And they were really, really impressed that I did that. And I was 100% wrong on the sound that they were looking for. Wow. But I ended up getting the gig and we just tweaked the sound. And, and uh, you know, I did, I'd never worked with these people, so I had no idea what they were going to want. But mm -hmm. I ma made an impression on them by putting in an effort instead of walking in as a lot of other guys do, uh, which is something nobody should ever do, no matter how successful they are, never have an attitude. Mm. You can always be replaced. Right. And a lot of these 
guys in the stories I've heard of people I don't know where they throw a hissy fit, fit during a mix or something and uh, they're out. It's over. It's a very small business. Mm -hmm. Yep. Word travels fast, right? Real fast. <laughs> if I hear about it, what some guy I had never met did in New York, real fast. Wow. Wow. Now, is there any difference in how you approach a project versus the type of product? Like, in, in other words, video game, commercial, television, or to you, is it just, it's just music? Or do you have like a certain kind of mindset or kind of, you know, uh, bubble you have to put yourself in when you're going to these kind of content? Does that make sense? I have to switch up and back and usually clear my head for a bit. Like right now, I finished most of the stuff for a video game, mm -hmm. a, a horror film, a detective um, series, and uh, this other show called uh, Who Do You Think You Are, which is kind of where they go back into the genealogy research of famous people. All are completely different. Got it. Some are more fun than others, but it's just a matter of I have to do something for all four today, so I'll do the morning, I'll do the, uh, you know, the cyberpunk for the video game and then take a little break, come back and just readjust. Got it. So luckily I'm able to do that. But I yeah. still get stumped now and then. I'm just doing a scene on this film. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this transition. So I'll just keep trying stuff until it just feels right. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. You got to kind of just kind of get out of the horror zone and into your kid, you know, animation zone, take a little break. Right. Go to, okay, that makes sense. The mix. Can oh, you just kind of take us through the stages of when you get a project to the completion date? And what, what, what does that look like all the way through? Sure. So, uh, for example, on a series, uh, there'll be the initial meetings. And again, I'll always present a few ideas. Most of the time I'm within the ballpark, in the ballpark. And then um, uh, Nickelodeon um, never allows the composers to do a theme, but usually I'll, I'll work on the theme first. Mm -hmm. And once we establish that, that sort of establishes the sounds for the cues for the show, for the music cues. Mm -hmm. So that's the very first step. Then they generally send me a rough cut of the pilot, or if I'm lucky, the, the final cut of the lock. They call it locked when it's done, the lock copy of a pilot. And I'll send them, let's say uh, there's uh, going to be 18 transitional cues, because that's what happens in live action stuff. Mm -hmm. I'll just send them three to seven choices per transition. And they get to pick what they want, and then I start dialing in what they like and what works best, and building the library of sounds for future shows, and then it gets easier and easier. And it takes, let's say the the first season has 20 episodes, mm -hmm. it takes about 10 episodes to really nail everything down to where now they don't even need to hear stuff in advance. We just go, I just get the final cut, do two or three choices, mm -hmm show up at the mix stage and uh, like with Thunderman's and I forgot it, like 107 episodes. There was only one time my three choices were completely wrong for one transition. They said, come up with something else, grab my laptop, run off to another room with a little keyboard and bang something out. <laughs> that's hot. That's, that's awesome. And it's man. always the one that's near the end of the mix. So it's not like I've got an hour and a half where the mixes last like three hours. Not like I have an hour and a half. It's always in the last 10 minutes. Right. Fix this one, which is a real, like, send your blood pressure up pretty high. Oh, my God. The transition. That is, am, I, am I correct? That's kind of like the, you know, your Seinfeld, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, like little bass line. Precisely. Okay, okay, got you. Okay. Precisely. And those things are the hardest to do. You would think they're easy because you're listening. You're like, it's like two chords. Right. But there's a million ways to do the two chords and a million different sounds. And did you get it just right? And is the tail, is, does it, the end of it just fade out just right? Did you, are you five frames too short? Now you got to figure out how to extend it. I mean, it's a lot of work, mm. but still scoring to picture like animation is the hardest, the absolute hardest. So to because animation? Animation is the most difficult because it is, it's usually a wall-to-wall -wall score and you just have to hit everything. Ooh. And so you set up your uh, program so you're not even using, uh, you know, four beats per measure. You're just using one beat, do, 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 which makes it simpler to mm -hmm. change tempos and hit certain things. Man, that's interesting. So I would have thought of the opposite, that there was live action and with, with, 
actors would be hardest. Now, when you're talking about like animation cartoons, um, you, you're doing scoring, of course, in the transitions. How do you approach? Is it the same approach when doing you're doing things that are not really they're not scores, they're more like just sounds, like the Flintstones when you know there you're hearing like Barney Rubble, you know, <laughs> rolling off the down at the cliff. Are you doing those things too? Is that a, a completely different? That's a completely different thing. And okay. on every cut I get, sometimes mm-hmm. I'll put in temporary sound effects. Mm-hmm. But while I'm doing the score, the sound effects guy is at his place doing his work. Got it. So I have to imagine what it's going to sound like. Mm-hmm. And if there's something like a jet engine, I don't know what key the jet engine is in. Mm. So sometimes I'll do a backup. If I have a cue, I'll do it in several keys. And that way, if we're on the mix stage and there's this horrible dissonant thing happening, I could say, okay, go to the alternates in different keys. And that way it won't rub against the sound of a jet engine or a helicopter or something. Wow. So, so the actual, you might actually, you're thinking about actually the musicality and sounding something sounding nice sounding transition, but it can't, it still can't contrast with a, jet engine or a dinosaur or something like that it still has to kind of be in key so to speak yeah exactly that's insane and and uh it's that's just a giant crap shoot wow. unless you're john williams in which case i think they probably pitched the sound effects to meet john williams whatever his score is <laughs> that's yeah. john williams. and you had that power you're right exactly yeah. so going into that um what what's your what is your uh as far as equipment software what tools you're using um because i'm a lot of times i've talked to a few uh uh, other some film scores. Some of them have used to have big ensembles, and they still do bring in the orchestras. And some of them just have a little Pro Tools rig or whatever, and they have a keyboard and they they, they go at it. Um, what's yeah? What's that's your... what it's mm-hmm. down to. I mean, even mm-hmm. as recent as a few years ago, mm-hmm. whenever I've done, I've never done big orchestral scores. It just it hasn't happened, and that's fine. That's all film stuff. Three years ago, I had a massive desk with just mounds of rack gear in it. And ran everything through the rack here, still not for sounds, but for processing. And it just became a real pain in the butt. Right. So I went more and more in the box. And I was using Pro Tools mainly. I still do. But Pro Tools is so horrible for scoring. I mean, it's wonderful for – it just crashes. You run virtual instruments, and it just it just can't handle it. Really? When I do use it, I use it as MIDI only. And then it goes to a program called uh, Vienna Ensemble Pro, a separate software mm-hmm. program that also runs on the same computer. And I can load that up with, you know, 40, 50 different sounds. And then Pro Tools only crashes once in a while. <laughs> and yeah. then for video game scoring where it's not to picture, I use Ableton Live like a madman I because like yeah. the stuff I can do in that program and it never, ever crashes. Mm. But I used to have much bigger speakers, but now I have, I don't know if you'd see back here. I can see, yeah. But like those two speakers there are from, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget, N1 Audio or K1 Audio, NK Audio. And you put a microphone where my ears are and you hit and they calibrate automatically to the room right? environment. And those little things sound better and are more accurate than my $7,000 barefoot monitors, which I just sold that I had for years and years. It's hey, crazy how great they are. Hey, Ron, are you, are you going to tell me, because it's like, it's like you know, telling me t- Santa Claus is, isn't real, right? So is that behind you? Are you telling me you've scored some TV shows with that, that, that setup behind you? Oh, yeah. I've done most of the video game with that, and I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing a movie and three shows on this. This is amazing. That's it. I mean, I have 12 terabyte... A, a, a library stuff right you know sounds i have every sound there is and when new stuff comes out i'm complete sound whore and i'll just go buy something <laughs> else if it's going to work for the project so yeah uh you can do anything now a laptop the, the computer we're on is another thing i check mixes on mm-hmm. no keyboard in front of me here mm-hmm. but i have this uh, another set of the speakers but the laptop which works great but it heats up really fast. Right. So it can't handle intense scoring. Right, because you're doing like a million I can hear the fan right? on it going right now. It's just mad about Skype alone. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, and see, that's, so that's, that's the thing. That's it. Okay. It's a Mac Pro, and behind, right behind it is a full uh, USB power tray with just a ton of um, Samsung T1 S- SSD drives, which are about this big. Hold on, I'll show you one. Mm-hmm. They're this 
this size here, these Samsung drives. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're, they're, the USB. and they're holding the library. Yeah, everything's okay. on there. So I've got about um, I don't know nine or ten of these nice. plugged in on the back of that system, and you know they read really fast, and you can I don't write to them, but they're uh, they're great. Do you um let's let's talk about that for a second because because we're talking about the technical aspect now. Do you feel uh, someone trying to get into this industry? Uh, do you feel like formal education, classical training, et cetera, et cetera, is that a prerequisite? Do you feel in in, in twenty twenty to kind of have any kind of success in this field, or what do you think? Well, I, it, first of all, a degree doesn't mean anything. You still have to start off by uh, making good coffee. You should get a degree. You be a barista first. You'll get farther. <laughs> but, I mean, if you're, going, if you're going to be scoring films, if that's what you want, yeah, you should be trained on how to orchestrate. But for me, every music teacher I ever had um, asked me to leave because I would kind of be playing classical stuff, but I did it all by ear and I would do my own variation thing, my own arrangements, and they didn't like it. And all the way up through college with music theory, I would last a couple of weeks and they'd say, you know, please leave. <laughs> wow. And so I've never, um, it's not like a badge of honor. It's a little embarrassing, but it just goes to show it doesn't really matter um, that you have the degree. And except for one job a long time ago, correcting classical uh, piano stuff for a piano reproducing system, Yamaha owns it now. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, nobody, nobody cares about a degree. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you've served your time to get in, paid your dues, right. and that you're slowly moving up the ladder. You were good enough to get maybe one cue in a film with a major composer. Mm -hmm. And then you start developing relationships and networking, and you have absolutely no life during this time. You mm. just don't, which is, uh, you know, can be difficult, but the trade-off is if you really want to make it, it's like acting. You have to hold off on on having fun and possibly hold off on getting married and hold off on having kids mm. because you're going to be gone a lot. Now, when you say gone, you're talking about just immersing the work or traveling because why would you need, I'm, I'm thinking you you have a studio in the box, you know, right now. So yeah. go ahead. I mean, I'm home, mm -hmm. but, and, and my son's home, mm -hmm. but I'll be working. Right. Uh, so he can come in and we'll say hi, but I'm in the middle of working. Right. So it's the same thing as being gone. You're just you're not able to just hang out and do other right. stuff because you have all this work to complete. And back uh, up until I moved into this house, I had a studio always off premises. Mm -hmm. So it was always you know close, a half block, a block away. But you're gone, and the hours are nuts, and you do a lot of free work trying to get gigs. I had a, 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 a cinematographer tell me that uh, that in this industry uh, it it uh, encourages and rewards obsession. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> what do you? Because I'm sure at this point in your career you've hired uh, people to work with you, partner under you, that kind of thing. What do Actually, you... I haven't. Really? I've always I've been a one man operation my entire career. Is that right? There's, okay. There's been, and then there's been times I thought it would be so great to finish this, hand it off to somebody have them uh, you know, do the final mix, create the stems, upload everything, name all the cues, do the Excel sheets, fill out the cue sheets, do all that. But every time I tried to find somebody, I never had time to train them because it's gonna take forever to teach them how to do everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just kind of worked it into my schedule and got really fast at doing all that kind of crap. And that's about 30% of the work is either technical or Take or you know filling out paperwork or making sure things get delivered da 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 at, to the mix stage. So, but you just it's all part of uh, and I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up so poor and I was so poor up until you know the the 90s. So just the thought of paying somebody to do what I can do. I mean, I'm fine with having a gardener. That's about as far as it goes. I can clean my own house. <laughs> oh gosh, man, you gotta let that go. Hey, so, so just, so, but having said that, then uh, put yourself in 2020. You're just starting out. How, what would you say to somebody? You know, with all the social media, you know, the the apps and things of that nature. What would you do to prepare yourself to land your first gig, your first transition, or your first chance to get in the room with Ron? What would you do? What would be your game? I plan? would, uh, I would knock on doors. 
and or called production houses, depending, you know, you don't if you want to score a film, you don't really want to call jingle houses and you know that do commercials and go in and you intern. Mm -hmm. And you would basically what I would do these days is I've told other guys to do is write you know, one sentence. I want to intern. I'll be your bitch. I make great coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay and, and who knows you know in my life and don't do this because i'm not going to hire anybody but in my life uh you know when i was really busy if i'd ever had somebody write that i would have gone wow because what i constantly get is bombarded with long nine paragraph things about you know their education and right. all the stuff that they want to do. And that's wonderful. And then a few sound examples. And that already shows a lack of, of knowledge of what, how demanding this business is. You can't expect a stranger to take that kind of time. Right. And yeah. You know, oh, I'll take 15 minutes and read your letter and listen to all your samples. Yeah. You know, unless it's a, somebody's recommended them or it's a friend of the family or something that's like right. that. That's right. That's right. That's and right. then you just prepare yourself to go in and make uh, make nothing. I mean, when I started at Saban, I think for years I was making. So it was eighty nine to maybe ninety two. I was making between seven seventy five and eleven bucks an hour mm, for mixing wow. and a little composing. That's the way it goes. But you just smile and keep working, and then you get a break. And then you ask for more and they say no and you leave and you go independent and then uh, your name's already golden because you've had a couple good shows. So you start working right away. Mm. And it's all word of mouth. All word of mouth. Right. There's no resume. It's just who who did who, who like who liked you. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now what, uh, uh, before we get to your last piece of advice, uh, real quick, you had it. You, you can only do for a year one thing. Television. Live television, animation, video games. Pick one. I would love to do animation again. Really? I would like it. The challenge? Um, well, yeah, because it's so hard and it would really, it would help my, it would just help my brain because it is so incredibly difficult mm. that it would, and it's so fast paced and I would love to do it. Nice. Plus, if it was on a good network, there's a lot more royalties because it's wall-to-wall -wall music. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I got it. I knew that's, that's that cheap thing coming in again. That's that money thing. It's the cheap thing. <laughs> it's just in me. It's like people who went through the depression that can have to eat everything on their plate. You know, you right. just don't get over it. You never get over being poor. I hear it, man. I hear it. So what would you leave with somebody that wants to come into this business and thinking about any, any not even just uh, the, the um, um, composing, just in the actual entertainment uh, business of television or film. Give me, give me a piece of a last piece of a little nugget you can leave with them. I guess the last thing to get in is really to intern. I mean, when I started on <clears throat> some of these sitcoms in 2010, people came in making copies, and one of them is just announced he's uh, been promoted to producer on a show, which means he went from whatever. If, I don't even know if it's required minimum wage, I'm sure it is, to now he may be, for all I know, making uh, $20,000, $30,000 an episode as a producer. Mm -hmm. And he did that in just under 10 years. Which is not a long time, really, you know? It's not, because then there's, there's the suffering to get in, that's forever, and that's the overnight success, 10 years. And then if you're really talented and nice, you have a good long run, and then... Uh, you just start aging out at a certain point, unless you're a showrunner. Showrunners never, right. age doesn't affect them. But everybody else, they're like, oh, he's been doing that forever. I don't think he can do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. We all have, we're all in a milk carton in this business. It could be uh, over at any time. Expiration. Not missing person. I mean, expiration. Expiration. Day. Rod, man, this, is, this has been fun, man. And, and thanks for the honest information that you gave, man. I'm sure it's a lot of people that are going to, because like you didn't, you didn't, definitely didn't hold any punches. And, um, uh, any, oh, by the way, anything that you're excited about that you're working on that you can reveal or you just, we should look out for or just kind of... I think, away? well, next year, I've been working on this video game. I'd started beginning of last year uh, and it's going to be called The Nothing or Nothing. And you can check it out at Facebook. 
and talk about a one man operation. Mm -hmm. It's this guy that's running his own software business. Mm -hmm. He just opened a gym and he exclusively has written all the code for this RPG game. And it is better than a lot of the massive companies are doing. Whoa. And when it hits, uh, it's just remarkable. Uh, he never sleeps and he's just a genius. Right. So I think that game is going to be really big. What, what is it called again? The Nothing the or nothing. nothing. Okay, I'll look that up. Okay. But it's on Facebook. Uh, yeah, it's always in there. So it's it. just remarkable what this guy's doing. I mean, stunning. Got to check that out. And I will look for your work on that. Well, Ron, thank you so much, man, um, for your story, for giving your time. I know you're a busy guy. Um, I hope you'll be a friend to the show, man, and much continued success to you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. No Thanks problem. for having me and everybody no out there. Just work your ass off and be nice. And if you're really talented, you'll get somewhere. You awesome. really will. Awesome. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it, Ron. Be good. All right.